see whether you can create something for me. Okay. I would like you to picture uh, let's try uh, some teachers. We have to use this word loosely. Some are some are called teachers, they're not teachers, but they have the name of teacher. Uh, Socrates. Um, is it possible that you can pull out a couple of dialogues from Plato and try to get teachings. Not easy to get. Let us say these are the ideas and each one of the circles represents some ideas. You agree, if you have a teacher teaching, it's likely that um, this person that has the teaching has some uh, goal he wants to achieve or purpose. Is that likely? So here's something. And by the way, we can use other names in here. Do you know any other teacher in history besides uh, Sunk? L. Ron. Who? <laughs> L. Ron. L. Ron Hubbard. Oh yeah, yeah. But That's good. He was, no, 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 really. How about uh, good ones or bad ones? Teachers. Does it matter whether they were good or bad? Well, we're wondering whether or not there are other people other than Socrates and L. Ron Hubbard that could take the title of a teacher. Maybe J.C. J.C. <laughs> Right. The Trinity, J.C., the boss in the shadow, mm -hmm. as they're affectionately called. Mohan. Well, okay, we could have others. Buddha? Or or just Buddha? Diodama. Okay. Diodama. Okay. Diodama. next. So far, right, they're, they're taking on some kind of position. They have a kind of teaching, they have a purpose and a goal. And is it likely that uh, this drama that they're involved in well it really it really has uh, I'm gonna put a, another goal here, that for the sake of which. They do what they do. And would you agree, uh, it's very interesting in one respect that uh, part of it, the part of this teaching is not necessarily for everybody, but it's open, but selective. So therefore it's possible then there could be some inner circle, is that right? Yeah. Now, can you go the next step and say, necessarily, if they're playing this role in public, all right, in the public arena, that there's going to be some crisis. They're going to have to face some crisis. It may upset people. All right. 
and therefore there's going to be an opposition to this teaching. There has to be an opposition to the teaching or it's not very significant. And by the way, this opposition may create some kind of crisis for this person. <clears throat> and in Socrates' case, it was uh, being brought before the civil magistrates and, of course, being charged legally, right? Charged as a criminal. And therefore, there has to, there comes a point where there's a, a kind of pathos where this person has to undergo a certain kind of uh, range of experience, a certain kind of experience. And the kind of experience is pathos, pathos. Pathos also has the sense of uh, uh, must include some disillusionment. Can take the form why 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 what, was it that the situation was the way it was and it might have been better and they may have some remorse about it. If that's the case, uh, we can just call this pathos. Kind of personal, very personal. And then, um, through this, there has to be something then that emerges from it, right? There has to be some uh, uh, future and meaning, a meaning. Something significant for the future. And we can call that the uh, exode or the going out. This is the going out. Now, uh, this person, any one of these, we will have to say, comes out of uh, some tradition, right? A kind of reform, a kind of tradition. Must be able to represent And should have some kind of high status. Because, see, because in principle they could have avoided this and played out whatever it is they wanted to do on another level to escape whatever the consequences are for going public. So, um, and it would be good, by the way, for such an account to have, have, it, have it announced in some way. Right. To introduce it, kind of a prologue. that introduces the themes. And these and this theme must be of very great significance. 
Therefore, when this individual then unpacks the teaching, it's really unpacking the theme that was already announced in a prologue. Now, uh, a very interesting guy, several thinkers, by the way, by the name of Hankel, New Testament genius. He said, you know what this is? This is Aristotle's study of what it takes to write and to produce a tragedy. These are the elements of a tragedy. And there are six parts, and all great tragedies have them. This is what makes a tragedy a tragedy, I see. Because the person could have avoided those, and therefore they were willing to take on the risk of the fierce opposition against them and the inevitable crisis that occurred. An opposition crisis. And therefore, you know, it's quite possible to study the life of Jesus and the life of Socrates, you see, juxtapose them along this line. Because Hengel studied Aristotle, and in Aristotle's work, Rhetoric, there's a section in the Rhetoric on tragedy. Ah. And he outlines these six stages. And he says, isn't it interesting? He said, you know, you can take the Gospel of Mark and you can literally take it out and you'll see that there are natural divisions in the Gospel of Mark. There's the prologue, John the Baptist, he introduces the theme. Then up until the third chapter, the teaching in the early part of the fourth chapter, there's the teaching, third and fourth teaching becomes the teachings. And then after that, he reveals his purpose, his mission, the messianic mission. Then he gives the final instruction to his inner circle. And of course, through the opposition, there therefore comes an opposition to Jesus, and therefore comes the crisis. And therefore, he then is arrested, just like Socrates. And therefore, Hegel raises this question. He said, you know, the, the uh, whole New Testament is written in Greek. Galilee was a Greek settlement. It wasn't uh, Orthodox Jews, did not live there. Very few did. It was a city of, of uh, transplanted, because Greek settlements were throughout the region, and Galilee was one of the great centers. He said, therefore, isn't it likely, since they all spoke Greek, that a couple of those dudes may in fact have gotten into Aristotle, may in fact have watched Greek tragedies, now this made great sense because you can take the Gospel of Mark and you can cut it up exactly into six pieces and it fits exactly in it. And therefore it's pretty clear that this way of organizing a work has an immediate appeal. It organizes the material very nicely. It sets out the purpose, all the drama connected with it. So in any case, if you're interested in this, um, there's an article <clears throat> that I have that a student did for me at Golden West College outlining this. It's only five or six pages. It's well written, and I can pass around copies if you'd like. But See, you need to put the Apology, the Credo, and the Phaedo, and line it up against the New Testament. And make a study. It's amazing if you do it. You'll find it very beneficial. 
Now, if these are the elements of a tragedy, can you tell me uh, what is it that's key to a tragedy that really makes it universal? Because in one sense, it's not universal. The individual has to represent a very interesting or profound tradition. He has to have a high status in it. Not many people have such a background, and therefore, where is the universal appeal? In every case in a tragedy, there must always be what we can add to this, an Achilles heel. Every tragic figure has to have something in their past that they, right, that they ignore, right? something in their past. So therefore, this opens up this background, see, their past. There's something about their past that causes them to ignore events in their past or major, fundamentally major issues so there's something in their past that was significant that they should not have done, should not have ignored, should have dealt with, and that thing which they ignored plays a critical role in the whole drama because the implications of this play themselves out as a tragedy. Now, Aristotle very much likes Oedipus, right? and therefore he says, you know, Oedipus is the great model for this. You can put the Oedipus trilogy right in this, and it fits very nicely. He says, you know, Oedipus's problem was, of course, that on the road, when he was uh, fleeing his town, his, his township, he got in a fight with a man, killed him. Not unusual in those days, I imagine, to have confrontations and duels, dueling, an old fortune, an old sport. He ignored the consequences of it. And he also ignored the fact that the woman he was in love with, <coughs> married, happened to be, uh, uh, curiously enough, uh, older than himself. As a matter of fact, could have been his mother. Was his mother. So he ignored it. That ignoring plays out its drastic consequences. In the New Testament, Jesus, uh, all through the Europe, if you take the book divided in half, and it cuts, by the way, very nicely in half, there's 667 verses. If you cut it in half, that key point is the transfiguration of Jesus, which is the uh, most brilliant light of being, right? That's what it is, right? The transfiguration, the light experience. But all through this, he's very cautious and he tells everybody, watch what you call me. Don't call me this, don't call me that. I am. Here, he allows, he allows a certain title to play itself out that he denies here. These names that he then allows are Son of David, essentially, if he accepts that name and that title, then he is in a lineage seeking to overthrow Rome and then secure for himself the kingship of the Judea, right, of that whole land. And obviously he's not a He's not into politics. He disowns the title here. He allows it here. 
to be willing to be called by this name means you're willing to carry on with that image and therefore you can be arrested by the Roman uh, legions, obviously, and uh, be charged with insurrection. Here, with Socrates, right? What do they want to know about him, see? They want, they're charging him, they're calling him something, and what they call him is obscure because it's difficult for us to accept the name that these people call him. What do they call him in the apology? Corrupter of the youth. A what? Corrupter of the youth. A what? Corrupter. Corrupt. Corrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do they call him? Corrupter of youth. Corrupter of youth. Yeah. Yeah. What do they call him? Yeah. 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 Well, something. What? What? Wasn't he charged for um, making of gods? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, they say he has a they, see, it doesn't matter which one we're talking about. The people don't understand what he's doing. And in, in the apology, the whole apology, Socrates says, you know, you guys don't understand the nature of my practice. I'm a philosopher, you don't understand my practice. What I do is a practice. And he goes on and he tries to explain his practice. He said, but you guys don't believe that. You believe I'm someone who, now it's put, he says, the view they have of me they put in character and that characterization of me is in the play by Aristophanes. And what was that? Head in the clouds. More? Mm -hmm. Ridiculous, com comedic. He pries into the, under the earth and into the heavens. What kind of a person is that? He's a witch. Ch Chaconic. That's the name for it, right? Ch Chaconic. Uh, someone who delves into the depths, into Hades and heaven and hell. But he's a witch. He's, that's what they think of me. I'm a witch. He's, they don't understand my practice. So he tries to overcome what it is that they think he is by trying to reveal his practice. He says, that practice, by the way, is philosophy. He says, but you guys don't understand that because you have a prejudice against this word because you think what those people are doing who are philosophers are people who are <laughs> getting into the, into the <laughs> spirit world, demons and things of that nature. <laughs> and they, hey, you know what? See, he's challenging the name. He's challenging the title. He's trying to reveal to them to overcome it. He can't. He doesn't. Neither of them do. So in this case, Jesus ignores it, and it plays out its fury. Socrates tries to reveal it, but it's not accepted. Now, let me ask you. Is it likely that this has a universal appeal, not only because we like to see great people in a dramatic scene, but we all have ignored certain things in our lives that we've done and maybe forgot, and the implications of them are playing havoc in our lives. My God, it's a pathologos. 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 That's what it is, pathology. Now, what makes this another step interesting is that each of these people, this drama plays itself out when they reach a peak in their career. Just like in, and is expected in philosophical midwife, and when you're going out for what you most think is important to you and most personally significant and meaningful, watch out! Because what you have ignored in your past, 
like to forget is going to surface, is going to surface, necessarily is going to surface, as you start climbing to reach your goal. Bang! What you've tolerated and allowed, now you have to face. Uh, okay, I'll give you a question now. Okay, it's a curious question. Um, one of the curious things in literature is that Aristotle spent a good deal of time writing about comedy. It's all lost. It's all lost. Just a couple of lines. Is it possible that the structure of tragedy is the same as comedy? What would be the difference? What would be the difference? See, this means, of course, that there has to be a major figure Same here. Misunderstood. Has to be in opposition. <clears throat> what makes a comedy a comedy? Now that's Ridiculous. central to the symposium. Right. These two issues, tragedy and comedy. Is, by the way, is it possible that you could say... Uh, that all life is tragic comic? Did you not say there's a tragic comicality to human existence? That anyone's problem, can you not agree, we can make fun of and turn it into a joke so long as they're not around? <laughs> can we? Could we? Yeah. Well, let me check. Could we? Yeah, absolutely. But, but what makes it, what, what do we do to make it into a comedy, you see? Yeah. Now, Agathon won first prize for writing a tragedy. Socrates didn't show up for the celebration of Agathon's victory. Agathon now is going to give a speech on the nature of love. You know what? He's not going to give a speech based upon a tragedy. He's going to offer comedy. Aristophanes, what did he do? He wrote comedy. He said, I'm going to take this theme and I'm going to create it. He created a whole story, did he not? And he said, hey, by the way, make sure you just... Uh, you see the comic side to what I am writing and what I'm speaking about, and just don't take it as if it was just or merely ridiculous. Right? So there has to be also a ridiculous element of this, but it can't be just ridiculous, otherwise there's nothing really significant in the comedy. You have to find something in it. See, we don't have, in our culture, we don't have comic figures. The way out See, the way out in the modern world is a comedian makes jokes about himself. I'm a this, I'm a that, and we laugh at him. Is that correct? In this, in this drama, you see, there has to be issues, have to be issues. Therefore, in the Greek world, the comedy, you have to pick issues. And Aristophanes, of course, wrote one great comedy on Socrates. Also did the clouds, you know, did five of them. So look here. Wouldn't you agree we're wasting our time, we should be reading one of the plays, uh, one of the comedies? I don't agree with that. Now they say the greatest one, of course, is Lysistrata. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. That means it has to have what? It has to have all of those, but in a different way. 
So when Lysistrata, Estrada, what Aristophanes does, he takes the major issue, war. Let's find a way to end war. Major issue, good issue, isn't it? It has to be a figure who's willing to stand down and take it. All right, all right, we're going to get it right. It's got to be a prologue. Right? It has to be some teaching involved. It has to be a purpose. It has to be final instruction to the inner circle. It has to be some pathos when the reversal of fortune takes place. Right? And a going out, an exoday, which is really where it should go as a consequence when you leave what you take with you. That's an exoday, right? If you think in these terms, then you won't have any trouble understanding what Agathon is doing when we read his play, when we read his speech. Now, Hangel did a beautiful work. It's a great article, by the way. And uh, as I say, I have copies of this wonderful article a young lady wrote in my class, and Bill Gilbert included it in the uh, chariot. And therefore, would you not agree I should shut up, sit back, and get a cup of coffee until we 10 o'clock so we can go to work? Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I have some journals up here from the different Greek philosophy societies. And if there are any that you'd like, please take them. Right? A whole bunch of different kinds of articles on a variety of things at random. By the way, all of these come from uh, Rod Wallbank, and he wanted to pass them on. Uh, the Ecology of the Critias and Platonic Metaphysics. Uh, Plotinus and Ecology. Philosophy of Body and Plato's Thought. Aristotle's Physics. Mystical Paradox in Buddhism, Imagination and Transcendence in Wallace Stevens, William Blake, Job and his Theory of the Imagination, Light and Existence in Iranian Philosophical Thought, all kinds of stuff, and uh, good references, so uh, it shows you what to do, where you can go later, so please take a look. Iranian philosophical thought. Thanks. Sir? I'm just, uh, just uh, Iranian philosophical thought. That's what it said. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's cheap. It's the reference to it, and therefore you can get it. It's all footnoted, so you can there. We're on page 90 in the Rouse, about 194 D or C. And uh, if we get a reader, we can play. Right? Uh, in, order to, in order to divide up the work, uh, I think it's... Uh, Perfectly okay then for me to be uh, favorous, and if someone else is willing to uh, be Agathon. Uh, 
Sure. Agathon? Okay. Okay. Agree we can pick it up. Then well. Phaedrus put in a word and said, My dear friend Agathon, if you answer Socrates, he will not care what becomes of our business here. He won't care anything about anything so long as he can have someone to converse with, especially someone beautiful. For myself, I like hearing Socrates arguing, but it's my duty to care about the praise of love and to exact from each one of you his speech. So, so just pay up to the God, both of you, and then you may argue. Quite right, Phaedrus. I am ready to speak. Socrates will, there, Socrates will be there another time and often to talk to. Okay. First then, I wish to describe how I ought to speak, then to speak. It seems to me that all who have spoken so far have not praised the God, but have congratulated mankind on the good things which the God has caused for them. What that God was himself who gave these gifts, no one has described. But the one right way for any laudation of anyone is to describe what he is, and then what he causes, whoever may be our subject. Thus you see with love. We also should first praise him for what he is, and then praise his gifts. I say then that all gods are happy. But if it is lawful to say this without offense, I say that love is happiest of them all, being most beautiful and best. Say, uh, just for a moment, uh, what do you think of what took place so far? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I guess I just appreciate him saying why all of the speeches before were inadequate and what it is that he will he will offer. Okay. Isn't that the prologue we just read? Pardon me? Isn't that the prologue we just read? Okay. All right, okay, we'll go on then. Well, uh, let me ask you again. Um, would you mind telling me how he's going to proceed and why he needs to proceed in the way in which he plans on exploring and in this speech on love? First, what's the first issue? How he ought to speak. Well, you know, but why? What's his purpose? Well, that doesn't really... Well, one, on the one hand, he's saying that that no, everyone has, has only been talking about these gods making these great things that have had, and they've been discussing the effects they've had on mankind. So it sounds like he's going to correct that, but then he says that what someone should do is really talk about the cause of the, of the gods. Okay, okay. So well, but, he says, but, he says, but he says first you that picked, we should figure out one what out he of is. Three. Yeah. He said, first he says the right way for any laudation of validation of anyone is to describe what he is. First, what first, he is. All right. He goes, and then, what he is. and then what he causes. And then what he causes. Whatever the subject. Whatever the subject. <laughs> therefore, how does he plan, therefore, in speaking? That he's going to go through what he is, what his cause is, what he Wait causes. On. That's what would you would expect. You would expect. Yeah. But what does he say? Keep going. We said first keep he reading. said we should pray. No, just keep reading. Oh, okay. What he is, and then what he calls whoever may be our subject. Thus, you see, with love, we also should first praise him for what he is. Wait a minute. Uh-oh. He changed it. He did. Yes. Now we're going to praise him for what, for he, what is. he is, and... Then praise his gifts. Ah. Not his causes? Not his causes. Not his causes. But his gifts. What he gives a mankind. Oh. So he's changed it. You've, oh, he changed it. Oh, how interesting. I wonder whether he might do that again. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. 
I say then that all gods are happy. But if it is lawful to say this without offense, I say that love is happiest of them all, being most beautiful and best. And how he is most beautiful, I am about to describe. First of all, Phaedrus, he is youngest of the gods. He himself supplies one great proof of what I say, for he flies in full flight away from old age, who is a quick one, clearly, since he comes too soon to us all. Love hates him naturally and will not come anywhere near him. But he is always associated with the young, and with them he consorts, for the old saying is right, like ever comes to like. I am ready to admit many other things to Phaedrus, but one I do not admit, that love is older than Kronos and Iapetos. No, I say he is youngest of the gods, and ever young. But that old business of the gods, which Hesiod and Parmenides tell about, was done through necessity and not through love, if they told the truth. For if love had been in them, there would have been no gelding or enchaining of each other and all those violent things, but friendship and peace, as there is now and has been ever since love has reigned over the gods. So then, he's young, and besides being young, he's tender. But we need a poet like Homer to show the gods tenderness. For Homer says of Ate that she was a god and tender. At least her feet were tender, when he says that uh, tender are her feet, uh, she comes not near the ground, but walks upon the heads of men. Uh, he did it again. I think he gives good proof of her tenderness, that she walks not on the hard, but on the soft. Then let us use the same proof for love, that he's tender, for he walks not on the earth, nor on the top of heads, which are not so very soft but both walks and abides in the softest things there are. For his abode is settled in the tempers and souls of men, of souls of gods and men. And again, not in all souls without exception, no. Whenever he meets a soul with a hard temper, he departs. But where he is soft, he abides. So, since he always touches with feet and all else the softest of the soft, he must needs be tender. You see then, he is youngest and tenderest, but besides this, his figure is supple. For if he were stiff, he could not fold himself in everywhere or throughout every soul and come in and go out unnoticed from the first. A great proof of this good proportion and supple shape is his gracefulness, which, as we all know, love has in high degree. For there's always war between gracelessness and love, Colors and beauty are testified by the gods nestling in flowers. For where there is no flower, or flower is passed in, in body and soul and everything else, love sits not. But where the place is flowery and fragrant, there he both sits and stays. Of the gods' beauty, much more might be said, but this is enough. The virtue of love comes next. Chief is that love wrongs not and is not wrong. Wrongs no God, and is wronged by none. Wrongs no man, and is wronged by none. Nothing that happens to him comes by violence, for violence touched not love. Nothing he does is violent, for everyone willingly serves love in everything. And what a willing person grants to a willing is just. So say the city's king, the laws. And besides, and besides justice, he's full of temperance. It is agreed that temperance is the mastery and control of pleasures and desires, and that no pleasure is stronger than love. But if they are weaker, then love would master and control them. And being master of pleasure and desires, love would be especially temperate. Furthermore, in courage, not even Aries stands up against love, for it is not Aries that holds love, but love, Aries, love of Aphrodite, as they say. Stronger is he that holds than he that is held, and the master of the bravest of all would be himself bravest. 
Now the justice and temperance and courage of the God have been spoken of and wisdom is left. So one must try to do the best one is able to do. And first, that I may honor our art as Eryximachus honored his, love is so wise a poet that he can make another the same. At least everyone becomes a poet whom love touches, even one who before that had no music in his soul. This we may fittingly use as a proof that love is a good poet or active maker in practically all the creations of the fine arts. For what one has not or knows not, one can neither give to another nor teach another. Now take the making of all living things. Who will dispute that they are the clever work of love, by which all living things are made and begotten? And craftsmanship in the arts. Don't we know that where this God is teacher, art turns out notable and illustrious, but where there is no touch of love, it is all in the dark. Archery again, and medicine and divination were invented by Apollo, led by desire and love, so that even he would be a people of love. So also the muses in music, and Hephaestus in smithcraft, and Athena in weaving, and Zeus in the pilotage of gods and men. Hence, you see also, all that business of the gods was arranged when love came among them. Love of beauty, that is plain, for there is no love in ugliness. Before that, I said at the beginning, many terrible things happened to the gods because of the reign of necessity. So the story goes. But when this God, love, was born, all became good, both for gods and men, from loving, beautiful things. Thus it seems to me, Faders, that love comes first himself, most beautiful and best, and thereafter he is cause of other such things in others. And I am moved to speak something of him in verse myself, that it is he who makes peace among men, calm weather on the deep, respite from winds in trouble, rest and sleep. He empties us of estrangement and fills us with friendliness, ordaining all such meetings as this one, of people one with another, in feasts and dances and sacrifices becoming men's guide. He provides gentleness and banishes savagery. He loves to give goodwill, hates to give ill will. Gracious, mild, illustrious to the wise, admirable to the gods, enviable to those who have none of him, treasured by those who have some of him, father of luxury, daintiness, delicacy, grace, longing, desire, careful of good things, careless of bad things, in hardship, in fear, in drinking, in talk, a pilot, a comrade, a standby, and the best of saviors. Of all gods and men, an ornament, a guide most beautiful and best whom every man must follow, hymning him well, sharing in the song he sings as he charms the mind of gods and men. This Phaedrus is my speech. May the God accept my dedication, partly play, partly modest seriousness, and the best that I am able to do. They all applauded. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, would you agree he recognizes that he's playing? Right? My speech is partly play, potted, partly modest seriousness. <clears throat> so, how should we look at it? Come on, what's the, how would you organize? Are there parts to it? Can we cut it into parts and divisions? And if so, where would you make the mark so that we can then see the structure? Notice there's no drama. Everything we did up to this point, talking about tragedy, is certainly not in evidence. So apart from that, what would you say? How would you break it up? Where would you make the divisions? Did you say he has certain goals? And if so, what are his goals? 
Um, well, he splits it up himself. I don't know if that would be helpful or not, but he says, now the justice, the temperance, the courage of the God have been spoken of, and then the wisdom is left. So he splits it up into four parts. And therefore, what is left? Wisdom. So therefore, there's a section on wisdom, is there mm -hmm. not? Mm -hmm. And he should also have had evidence of the other virtues? Right. 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 Okay. I'll take that. More? The other virtues, justice and temperance? Sir? The other virtues, justice and temperance. Encourage. 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 As you reflect on it, what grade would you give him? Oh. Maybe a C. A C. Good heavens. That means it's just a little bit better than passing. Just average. Go. What grade? Yeah, he failed. Why? Um, you mean he doesn't give examples of these things? Not Really? I mean, he just if says yes, then how is he them. doing? No, he doesn't. Louder? I mean, he gives examples of it. Yeah, no. He, he does the usual he thing that he, he does the usual thing that happens when when somebody asks a question, or when Socrates asks a question, he asks. I forget if it was in the uh, who's the guy Alcibiades who comes in in the end, and he said. What is justice? And then he said, "Well, I'm sorry. I asked you. Cecil, I asked you what clay was, and you told me pot makers clay, doll makers clay, house makers clay. And I want to know what clay is: moisture and earth. So he doesn't. He starts off good and says that he wants to describe what he is, but then he doesn't describe what he is. And then he uses these different things: justice, temperance, and courage. But he well, does describe. he at least uh, praise the God? He does that and point out the gifts. Yeah, but he didn't do what he said he was really But he didn't do what he set out to do, yeah. though he's right. Okay. Uh, look here. Um, why don't we just read the uh, first couple of lines? Just all, just a couple first couple of lines. Would you do that? Um, Just the first sentence. I say then that all gods are happy, but if it is lawful to say this without offense, I say that love is happiest of them all, being most beautiful and best. Right? So, hmm. all the gods are happy, <laughs> and love is therefore most beautiful. Beautiful and best. Beautiful and best. Therefore, he's the happiest. Right? Agree? Mm -hmm. He doesn't really. He doesn't uh, show that that follows. Just because one is the most beautiful and best does not mean they're the happiest person in the room. Mm. Okay. Let's so try it again. Put it in other words. Same point. All right. So he he he's claiming that what, whichever God is the most beautiful and the best is going to be the happiest. But that doesn't necessarily follow. But what? It doesn't necessarily follow that... It which doesn't most, necessarily follow... That the most beautiful is the happiest. Okay. You're outside of the text, and therefore you're going to lose a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, but agree from what you're doing? Assume that, and let's see how he reasons, and then we can go back and say, by the way, I take exception to his opening passage. Okay. Right, look here. Would you agree he's setting out something? He's saying, you know what? Love? Hey, most beautiful and best. Does he then give evidence for both? He says he's yes. going to. Thank you. Does he give evidence for no. both? Well, let's just, look at what he, he calls says, evidence, well, shall yeah, we? Let's start thing. with beauty. Beautiful, he says, I'm about to describe. First of all, he's the youngest of the gods. Would you not agree? 
especially if any of you know, have you, any of you ever seen kids? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wouldn't you agree, the youngest they are, they're most beautiful? No. Oh. <laughs> oh. Got more? Now, look here, picture what the gentleman is saying, and let's have some fun. Come on. Would you read it then? Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Uh, and how he is most beautiful, I am about to describe. Thank you. What is he going to do? He's going to describe how he's most beautiful. He's going to tell us? Evidence, right? Proof of why that's most beautiful. Go ahead. First of all, Phaedrus, he is youngest of the gods. He himself supplies one great proof of what I say. Oh, uh, he's going to have proof that he's the youngest of the gods. Good. Let's look at it, the proof. Go ahead. <laughs> For he flies in full flight away from old age. Who is yeah, that's a, proof, therefore, that he's the youngest. Who is a quick one, clearly, <laughs> since he comes too soon to us all. Love hates him naturally. Wait, what, what, what? Love is doing what? Hating him naturally. Hates? 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 I thought love was uh, happy. Right. That later contradicts what he's What's it now doing? He's happy and hateful. And he also hates? Go ahead. <laughs> love hates him naturally and will not come anywhere near him. But he is always associated with the young. And when he... Oh, therefore, love was only among mankind. He's only among whom? The young. The young. Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. So if there are a whole bunch of people, right? <clears throat> It's mostly with kids. Is that right? Young? That's where love is. Go ahead. Cradle robber. <laughs> Go ahead. Rolling. <clears throat> um, Go ahead. And with them he consorts. Oh, and with them he consorts. <laughs> For the old saying is right. Like ever comes to like. Yeah, and since he's the youngest of the gods... He would then be among the youngest yeah. of mankind, and therefore he fools around with what? He's the youngest. Kids. Very no. young. Is that right? <laughs> Go ahead. Can you say pedophile? <laughs> I am ready to admit many other things to Phaedrus. Good. But one, I do not admit that love is older than Kronos. Oh, love can't be older than Kronos. And Ipetos. No, I say he is the youngest of gods, and ever young. But that old business of gods, which Hesiod and Parmenides tell about, was done through necessity and not through love. If they told the truth, for if love had been in them, there would have been no gelding or enchain enchaining of each other and all those violent things, but friendship and peace. Right, you'd agree with love that's always friendship and peace? Yeah. yeah. No. No way. No, 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 no. But by the way, this is all proof of why love is uh, most beautiful. Is that right? Yeah. Isn't he doing a good job showing the beauty of love? Because it hates old age. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Hates it. And uh, ever with the youngest. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. That shows he's beautiful. But friendship and peace, and there is now, or as there is now and has been ever since love has reigned over the gods. Thank you. Got a picture of all the gods? Mm-hmm. Who rules over all the gods? Love, baby. The youngest Is love. The youngest, right? Love. So the baby rules over the heaven. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, a little Cupid. Right? I mean, that really makes sense. So, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, like, like the like the and all those little babies up mm -hmm. there. He's a yeah, baby lover. Right, there's a god in heaven. What is he? He's a baby. <laughs> All right, younger, ever young, never grows old. Right. No, no development, no growth, nothing, right? Oh, good. No wisdom. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I like this mythology. Go ahead. So then, he is young, and besides being young, he is tender. Now, wait a minute. What happened to best? <laughs> tender. Do you, uh, would you agree we have great proofs that he's most beautiful? No. 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 So we get a new one. He is now tender. Thank you. And that's important, isn't it? Love is tender? Yes. Uh, no. By the way, what kinds of things are tender? Steaks. Steaks. Okay, I just thought I'd ask. But love is what? 
Tender and young. Tender and young, right. Mm. Good combination. Uh, uh, what maybe? Go ahead. <laughs> and besides being young, he is tender. But we need a poet like Homet to show the God's tenderness. Ah, that's right. That's what we're going to do. Oh, this gives me a chance to show off my art. Go ahead. For Homer says of eight that she was a god in tender. At least her feet were tender. When he says that tender are her feet. Eight, like eight, eight walked right? on the heads of men. Yeah, yeah. Which are the softest things there are, of course. Right. Right. I think he gives good proof of her tenderness. Oh, hey, wait a minute. What are we going to get? Proof of her good tenderness. Good proof of her tenderness. Yeah, good. His. Yeah. Here's mine. That she walks not on the hard, but on the soft. Oh, what does that do to what he just said? Contradict. Contradict. Uh, what does that do to what he just said about the image you use? Oh, instead, hardest, now he's going to uh, tell you about tender and walks on the what? Softest. And that really is good proof of why you call the god tender, because, uh, uh, well, anyhow, our feet are tender. Sorry, why was that a contradiction? <laughs> right, and that really because shows that the um, yeah. god is tender and beautiful and best. He actually says heads aren't soft. Later. In the text. Well, let's see. Go ahead. Later, yeah. Um, then let us use the same proof for love. Well, wait a minute. He's going to use the same proof? Yeah, just what proof him. did he have so far? None. Oh, none. But he's going to use the same proof? Absolutely. <laughs> For what? Worked work the last time. For he walks not on the earth, nor on the tops of heads, which are not so very soft, but both walks and abides in the softest things there are. Oh, good, good. What is, what, what, well, what is What's it about? That? For uh, his abode is settled in the tempers and souls of gods and men. Oh, oh. into the souls and tempers of gods and men. <laughs> and again, not in all souls, oh, without no. exception. No, no. No. Wherever he meets a soul with a hard temper, he departs. But where, is, but where it is soft, he abides. So since he always touches with feet and all else, the softest of the soft, he must needs be, ten be tender. You see then, he well, is if, youngest. If he then abides with things that are soft, that means he's soft. Mm -hmm. Does that follow? Or does that just mean he likes to be around things that are soft? Mm -hmm. Same thing as with the young. Just because he consorts with the young doesn't mean he's youngest. Not at all. Well, we're going to use the same proof. Go ahead. You see then, he is the youngest and the tenderest. But besides this, his figure is supple. Okay, next. What is it? He's supple. Supple. And that shows he's beautiful and best. Okay, supple. For if he were stiff, he could not fold hey. himself <clears throat> in any, any everywhere. <clears throat> There's a bunch of guys that are sitting around, they're drinking, wine is being passed around, they're having a lot of fun. Uh, do you know anything else that's uh, hard and stiff? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Stiff drink. What? A stiff drink. <laughs> a stiff drink. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> now, like her, is there any sexual o o kind of motif going Absolutely. on? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Are you sure? Take a look. Don't lose it. Go ahead. But besides this, his figure is supple. For if he were stiff, he could not fold himself in everywhere, or throughout every soul, and could come in and go out unnoticed from the first. He can go in and out unnoticed. <laughs> that proves he's supple. 
<laughs> I just wonder whether you have any images going. That's all. You know, I'm just wondering. This whole question of folding in on himself everywhere. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, more. And throughout every soul, and coming in and out unnoticed from the first. Hmm. <laughs> now you're reading. Now what does it take to read this guy? <clears throat> John, what does it take to read this guy? He's having a lot of fun. Yes. You've got to have fun. Okay, let's try it a little bit more. Okay, go ahead. Good. A great proof of his good proportion and supple shape is his gracefulness. Ah, now we're going to get gracefulness. Right, go ahead. And that's a proof of something. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, that's proof. Which, as we all know, love has in high degree. For there is always war between gracelessness and love. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's true, isn't it? Where? Is that right? I mean, that's, that's always true. Is that true? No. Never been. <clears throat> Gee, love is at war and hates. My, oh, my. That, this, this, this doesn't turn out to be a happy God, does it? No, no. <laughs> yeah, well, right. it's going to get worse. Oh, I remember a story that Aphrodite used to wear a girdle and that this girdle bestowed the power of gracefulness. Mm -hmm. And that gracefulness was something that you could take on and uh, put on and take off. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what he referred yes, to, yes, but yes. that's, that's, yeah, that's there. I remember. Go ahead. <clears throat> Colors and beauty are testified by God's nestling in flowers. Go, do that again. <laughs> Colors and beauty are testified by the God's nestling in flowers. Yeah, that <clears throat> shows why God has what? Gracefulness. Gracefulness and also color? And beauty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the proof? <clears throat> For where there is no flower, or flower is past, in body and soul and everything else, love sits not. But where the place is flowery and fragrant, fragrant there he both sits and stays. Got a picture of it? Right, Ferdinand the Bull, right, or sitting with the flowers and the <laughs> right, yeah. 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 right. Now, this certainly shows that he's graceful because uh, right. <laughs> he nestles around flowers. Is that right? Good, good. It's a very fine speech with careful thought. <laughs> several pots of wine. Yeah. How bad? Uh, could we get to do some more work, or should we pass the buck? Please go on. Of the God's beauty, much more might be said. Has he said anything? No. <laughs> None? But that's but, enough. But this is enough. Good. Therefore, now what are we going to go back and get? The virtue. Best, right? It hasn't touched best, right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The virtue of love comes next. Oh, good. Good, good, good. So glad to hear that. Chief is that love wrongs not and is not wrong. Wrongs no God and is wronged by none. Wrongs no man and is wronged by none. Nothing that ha happens to him comes by violence, for violence touches not love. Good. No by the way, do you have anything that comes to your mind that matches that? Nothing. Well, how can I he, do. How can he be in war? Yeah, I do. Why? Huh. That's why I wanted your opinion first. <clears throat> well, we said before that love. Um, do you have anything hates. that matches his description of love's virtue? I do. What you. is it? It doesn't do anything. Anything? Look here. What do I have in my hand? Piece of chalk. 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 An inanimate well, You're going to keep that in mind? Mm -hmm. Read it again. Go ahead. Chiefly that love wrongs not hey, and is not this wrong. chalk has never wronged a person. Agree? Agree. Go ahead. And is not yeah. wronged. Right. 
Go ahead. Wrongs no God and is wronged by none. Agreed. No one ever goes around and tries to punish this, does it? Wrongs no man and is wronged by none. Right. So that is love. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) A rock will do just as well. You don't have to use chalk. Nothing that happens to him comes by violence, for violence touches not love. Nothing he does is violent, for everyone willingly serves love in everything. Okay, now there's a new new proof. What is it? Do it again. Everyone willingly serves love in everything. Good. Read it again. Willingly serves love. What is he talking about now? Come on, watch the ethic comes out of this. The virtue. Go ahead. And what a willing person grants to a willing is just. Thank you. Anything. Anything. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) What is he saying in the name of love? Come on. As long as someone's willing, it's just. Who's receiving? Who's the actor? Lover. See, you got those four terms. Love. Lover. Beloved, loving. Anything a willing, go ahead. Who would that be, the lover or the beloved? Come on, just. And be a beloved. And what a willing person grants to a willing is just. Right. He has a whole ethic there, doesn't he? Right. So the beloved just. Anything that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Anything that the anything beloved that, agrees anything to. that the lover wants of the beloved is theirs. Right. Just That's right. Spread them, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought that the lover had to be willing. Yeah. As long as the beloved uh, <laughs> says it's okay, then it, that makes it just. Yeah. It's anything. Sword goes. for infants. That's hardly justice. More. <laughs> I was just saying that's hardly justice. Oh, <laughs> but it, he, he's talking about the virtues, though, right now, so we have to be careful. Mm-hmm. Too willing is just. The other thing is that love is being served. And Serving. This, yeah, so love is what is being loved. That's right. It is not the lover. <clears throat> it is not the lover. It's being served. Yes. That's right. What a willing person grants to a willing is just. You got it. So say. Do it again. What a willing person person grants to a willing is just. Yeah. So anything these kids do to the lover is just, doesn't it? As long as 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 they're willing. As long as they're willing to do it, it's just. Yes. And it's serving love. Yeah, and and they're serving love. Go ahead. This guy may have wanted to uh, defend Michael Jackson. (laughs) So say, so say the city's king, the wasp, and besides justice, he is full of temperance. Okay, now we're going to get temperance. It is agreed that temperance is the mastery and control of pleasures and desires, and that no pleasure is stronger than love. But if they are weaker, then love would master and control them. And being master of pleasures and desires, love would be especially temperate. Right. Love is a master of pleasures, and therefore it's temperate. Mercy. (laughs) Yeah. I guess that means all tyrants tyrants are temperate. Yeah. Who knew? Furthermore, encourage... Not even Aries stands up against love, for it is not Aries that holds love, but love, Aries, love of Aphrodite. As they say, stronger is he that holds than he that is held. Good. It's the same thing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Tyrants rule. Yeah. But again, the object, right? Mm-hmm. The holding and the holder. Yeah, what a relationship. The holding, that's important. For whom? The person being held. He thinks, therefore, being held is far superior to the person doing the holding. Mm-hmm. Therefore, 
Come on, active agent. Come on, what do you want to say? Beloved, beloved, what is relationship? What kind of activity is now being judged? Okay, go back, take a look again. Come on. Stronger is he that holds than he is that than he that is held. Well, it sounds like the strong the stronger is the one that are they saying that the one that's holding is in a, a better position is most benefited. They're saying that he is stronger. They're saying that Aphrodite has power over Aries because mm -hmm. he's held by her love. But she's holding him. Right. So okay. she has more power. So yeah, that, that love is the one there. That's right. Okay. And so then it continues to say, well, this, this thing, the stronger is he that holds, is he that holds is love. In this case, holding Aries or Aphrodite holding mm -hmm. Aries. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Stronger is he that holds than he that is held, and the master mm -hmm. of the bravest of all would be himself bravest. It's again going back to love with master <coughs> and holding, and being master of pleasure and desires, love would, and being master of pleasure, love would be especially temperate. It's again this love is the master, it is controlling, it is the stronger. It is the master of the bravest, therefore it is himself the bravest. There's a culture issue. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, next one, next three. Justice, temperance, courage. Ah, they've all been spoken of. Therefore, what's left? Wisdom. Wisdom. We should now get it, should we not? Would you keep reading? Yes, keep going. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, now, the justice and temperance and courage of the God have been spoken of, and wisdom is left. So no one must try to do the best one. Oh, so one must try to do the best one is able to do. And first, this, no, that I may honor our art of Eryximachus, honor his honored his, love is so wise a poet that he can make another the same. At least everyone becomes a poet whom love touches, even one who before that had no music in his soul. This we may fittingly use as a proof that love is a good poet or active maker in practically all the creations of the fine arts. For what one has not or knows not one can neither give to another nor teach another. Now take the making of all living things. Who will dispute that they are the clever work of love, by which all living things are made and begotten, begotten, and craftsmanship in the arts? Don't we know that where this God is teacher, art turns out notable and illustrious, but where there is no what where there is no touch of love, it is all in the dark. Archery again, and medicine and divination were invented by Apollo, led by desire and love, so that even he would be a pupil of love. And all of this shows wisdom, doesn't it? I mean, it follows, doesn't it, if someone then is inspired by love, whatever they say in their writing is always wise? At least this Is that, no? No. Oh. Beware of love's on the contrary. Oh. <laughs> and even though craftsmen are inspired and makers of this and that, it shows therefore they're wise, does it not? No. Mm -hmm. Oh. But it sounds good. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Oh, keep going. Keep going. Archery again in medicine and divination were invented by Apollo, led by desire and love, so that even he would be a pupil of love. So also the muses and music and Hephaestus and Smithcraft and Athena and weaving and Zeus and pilotage of the gods and men. 
Hence you see, also all the business of the gods was arranged when love came among them. Love of beauty, that is plain, for there is no love in ugliness. Before that, as I said at the beginning, many terrible things happened to the gods because of the reign of necessity. So the story goes. But when this god love was born, all became good both for gods and men from loving beautiful things. This, it seems to me, Phaedrus, that love comes first, himself most beautiful and best, and thereafter he is cause of other such things in others. And I am moved to speak something of him in verse myself, that he is, that it is he who makes peace among men, calm weather on the deep, respite from winds, in trouble, rest and sleep. He empties us of estrangement and fills us with friendliness, ordaining all such meetings as this one, of people one with another in feasts and dances and sacrifices, becoming men's guide. He provides gentleness and banishes savagery. He loves to give good will, hates to give ill will, gracious, mild, illustrious to the wise, admirable to the gods, enviable to those who have none of him, treasured by those who have some of him. Father of luxury, daintiness, delicacy, grace, longing, desire, careful of good things, careless of bad things, and hardship, in fear, in drinking, and talk of Pilate, a comrade, a standby, and the best of all saviors, of all gods and men an ornament, a guide most beautiful and best, whom every man must follow, hymning him well, sharing in the song he sings as he charms the mind of gods and men. Yay! This, Phaedrus, is my speech. May the God accept my dedication, partly play, partly modest and seriousness, and the best that I am able to do. Nice, re nice reading, by the way. Would you not agree that quote up on the top of the page, the one that he loves? The quote and I am moved to speak something of him in verse. Got it? You'll himself, it. you see? You'll and uh, really could you look at that verse? What, isn't that a great insight into life? Peace among or you. is it? I don't know what in the world he meant by it. I wrote a little note here. What, what okay. he, it could be talking about anything. Okay. The quote is, Peace among men, calm weather on the deep, respite from winds, in trouble rest and sleep. Huh? Yeah, it's... Um, hmm? What's the matter? Bull, bullshit. Um, bull, bull what? <laughs> Why? I had some love experiences earlier today that uh, what? What? were incredibly <laughs> unpeaceful. No, no, no. <laughs> is there some weakness in this statement? The yeah, utmost it? disturbance. <laughs> <laughs> love seems to make war as much as peace. Peace among men. What's wrong with that? And come on, worthy of being praised? Sounds peace good. is not peace something to praise? Peace among men. Will you agree with that, sir? No. Why not? What the heck does that have to do you with that? war among men? If you're on a boat at the ocean, this makes perfect sense, because... There. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> Other than that. <laughs> now look here. Is there something that falls flat in this quote? That's all. Stay on the quote. Tell me about it. What does it have to do with love? <laughs> it seems like something you want the priest to say when you're going on a long ocean voyage. I mean, even even e look, yeah, even like if we even if we subtract somehow from the whole of creation all instances of romantic love, okay. um, just love between one's family members seems to be. No, no. I'd rather stay in the quote. Oh, okay, my bad. Stay in the quote and tell me about the quote. All right, peace among men, calm weather on the deep. Good. Respite from winds. Yeah. In trouble, rest and sleep. Yeah. What's wrong? I 
That's the best part of the whole speech, I think, I hope. Maybe. Okay, all right. I mean, it's a nice... Hmm? It's a, I mean, it's at best a, a, a sweet wish for somebody, but it, it, I just don't see it has anything to do with love. And it, it leaves out every... It leaves out all uh, relationships. There's no, there's no talk of being with anyone. You could be alone. You could be... What do you see, Pierre? Yeah, well... I don't know. Just he's, claiming that, he's claiming that Eros, or love, is writing this. Yeah. 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 I move to speak in verse. Well, one thing is true in the speech. <laughs> right. If you do have trouble, that's this is a way to handle trouble, isn't it? Yeah, take it. Snooze. Right. Eternal <laughs> snooze. <laughs> right. <laughs> what does that sound like? Death. Yeah, just oh. if trouble, what should you do? Sleep it off, right? Is that right? Yeah. Rest and sleep. Wow. What is that? How is that? I would say those are good words to remember in case you ever need them. In case you're in hey, Harry, trouble. you in trouble? Huh? Rest and sleep. Bring a pillow. Call me in the morning, huh? and then then they're going to ignore the events or major oh. issues. What does he say about it? Come on. Well, when he says he empties us of estrangement, isn't that trying to support his peace among men? No. Yeah. Can we call this last paragraph dumping? As What's much that? As right. Everything. Everything goes into oh, yeah. the pot. Right. But what do you find about the themes? Come on, the themes that he's using. Themes. Because the themes are rather interesting. I'd like to focus on them for a while. Sacrifices. Should we read through them again? Well, the things. Yeah, this is bad things. See, as you go through this, if we could pull, a, pull out some of the things involved in here in the last two paragraphs, would you agree? He's talking about the arts. Includes many of them. Mm -hmm. right. Archery, mm -hmm. medicine, divination. Mm -hmm. Line them up. Take a look at all the things. See, he has all the right themes, mm -hmm. but he, how is he playing with them? Partly play, partly seriousness. But it's the best he can do. All right. Look, what if we take everything we find in Socrates' speech and then reread Agathon's speech? You'll find that he's going to deal with the same subjects, but in a different way. Now, um, If we could just take a look, like, how would you picture love in this last paragraph? Oh, especially, let's see. What is it doing? The best of saviors. Look at the language, right? The best of saviors. A guide. Beautiful and best. Every man must follow. Hemming offering hymns and charms, sacrifices, guiding. See all the terms? Mm -hmm. Every one of them is a key term in what Socrates is going to explore is the idea of love. Mm -hmm. Everything here. <clears throat> Only he's going to give something better than what Agathon gives. So therefore, we can have some fun. Let's go on. And Agathon had spoken. All applauded the young man. The young man was thought to have spoken becomingly for himself and, and for the god. Then Socrates looked at Eryximachus and said, Now then, 
son of Acumenos. Do you think there was no reason to fear in the fears I feared? Was I not a prophet when I said, as I just now, as I said just now, that Agathon would make a wonderful speech and leave me with nothing to say? He said everything. Put everything in it. The kitchen sink. Yes, to the first set of Rickamacos. You were a prophet there, certainly, about the wonderful speech, but nothing uh, to say? I, I don't think so. <laughs> Bless you. They all know him too well. <laughs> and, and how have I anything to say? I or anyone else, when I have to speak after that beautiful speech, with everything in it, the first part was wonderful enough, but the end, the beauty of those words and phrases, I, I was quite overwhelmed for any listener. The fact is, when I consider that I should not be able to get anywhere near it, and I have nothing fine to say at all, I, I was so ashamed that I all but took to my heels and ran, but I have nowhere to go. The speech reminded me of Gorgias. Uh oh, a sophist. Right? And I really felt quite as in Homer's story. I was afraid that Agathon, at the end of the, his speech, might be going to produce the Gorgon's head of Gorgias, the, the terror in speech making directed against my speech and turn me into, into stone with dumbness. What is he doing? Come on. Making fun. He's not. He's got a thumb going on Gorgias, his name. So look her. Let someone else pick, pick it up and finish it. So could you continue, please? Thank you. And I understood then that I was a fool when I told you I would take my turn in singing the honors of love and admitted I was terribly clever in love affairs. Whereas it seems <laughs> I really had no idea how the eulogy, how a eulogy, ought to be made. For I was stupid enough to think that we ought to speak the truth about each person eulogized. One. <laughs> and to make this the foundation Two. from which these truths to choose the most beautiful things. Three. And arrange them in the most elegant way. Four. And I was quite proud to think how well I should speak because I believe that I knew the truth. However, apparently, this was not the right way to praise anything, but we should dedicate all that is greatest and most beautiful to the work, whether things are so or not. If they were false, it did not matter. For it seems, the task laid down was not for each of us to praise love, but to seem to praise him. For this reason, then, I think, you rake up every story and dedicate it to love and say that he is so and so and the cause of such and such that he may seem to be most beautiful and best. Of course, to those who don't know, not to those who do, I suppose. And the laudation is excellent and imposing. But indeed, I did not know how an encomium was made. And it was without this knowledge that I agreed to take my part in praising Therefore, the tongue promised, but not the mind. So, goodbye to that. For I take it back now, I make no eulogy in this fashion. I could not do it. However, the truth, if you like, I have no objection to telling the truth. In my own fashion, not in rivalry, rivalry with your speeches, or I should deserve to be laughed at. Then see whether you want a speech of that sort, Phaedros. Will you listen to the truth being told about love in any words and arrangement of phrases, such as we may hit on as we go? Okay, what did he just do with that speech? Well, I am severely criticized that upon in all the prior speeches, didn't I? Yeah. Right. He lays out what he would do, four points. Let's watch it. Go ahead. Phaedros and the others told him to go on and just as he thought best. Then Phaedrus, he said, let me ask Agathon a few little things that I may get his agreement before I speak. 
Oh, I don't mind, said Phaedrus. Ask away. After that, Socrates began something like this. Okay, hold it. Okay. And now comes the interlude between the speeches, and we need this to work to be worked out as a dialogue. So you play sock and we need an agathon. Agathon, thank you. Let's do it. Okay, go ahead. Indeed, my dear Agathon, I thought you were quite right in the beginning of your speech when you said that you must first show what love was like and afterwards come to his works. That beginning I admire very much. Now then, about love. You described what he is magnificently well and so on. But tell me this, too. Is love such as to be a love of something or of nothing? I don't mean to ask if he is a love of mother or father, for that would be a ridiculous question, whether love is love of, for mother or father. I mean it in the sense that one might apply to father, for instance, is the father a father of something or not? Okay. The, would, whole, the whole work is going to be of uh, this word, uh, of. Right. And we're going to play with E-R, I-N-G, right. love-er, love-ing, right. and especially be loved. But that's later. All right. So... Of. Love of something. Okay, here we go. I mean it in the sense that one might apply to father. For instance, is the father a father of something or not? You would say, I suppose, if you wanted to answer right, that the father is father of son or daughter. Is that correct? Certainly. See, lover. You're speaking on ER now. Of and ER. Watch the way it proceeds. Right. And the same with the mother? Mother, father, sister, brother. ERs, ERs, ERs. Go ahead. Yep. Another, please. Answer me one or two more that you may better understand what I want. What if I were to ask a brother now and himself? Is he brother of something? Yes. Of a brother or sister? Yes. Then tell me about love. Is love love of nothing or of something? Certainly he is love of something. Now then, keep this in your memory. What the object of love is. And say whether love desires the object of his love. Certainly. Is it when he has what he desires and loves that he desires and loves it? Or when he has or when he has not? Most likely when he has not. Just consider. Put necessary for likely. Isn't it necessary that the desiring desires what it lacks, or else does not desire if it does not lack? I think positively myself, Agathon, that it is absolutely necessary. What do you think? Well, I think the same. He shifted from of, E-R, to I-N-G, right? right? Loving, ing, I-N-G, right? Hey, desire, desiring. Are there many different kinds of desires? Mm -hmm. He's going to be quite strict, and he's going to say, you know, among the things that you call desire, one of them is going to be love. And everything's going to follow from that. <laughs> Let's see how he does it. Go ahead. Good. Then would one being big want to be big? Or being strong want to be strong? Impossible, according to what we have agreed. For I suppose he would not be lacking in whichever of these he is. That's true. For if being strong he wanted to be strong, and being swift he wanted to be swift, and being healthy, who wanted to be healthy, you might go on forever like this, and you might think that those who were so and so, and had such and such, did also desire what they had. But to avoid our being deceived, I say this, if you understand me, I define, it is obvious that these must have, at this present time, all they have, 
whether they wish to or not. And can anyone desire that? And when one says, I am healthy and I want to be healthy, I am rich and I want to be rich, I desire what I have, we should answer, you, my good man, being possessed of riches and health and strength, wish to go on being possessed of them in the future, since at present you have them, whether you want it or not. And when you say, I desire what I have, consider, you mean only that you want to have in the future what you have now. Right. Well, then you can you desire it, since you don't have it in the future, you can desire it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Then Socrates went on. Therefore, this love for these blessings to be preserved for him into the future and to be always present for him, this is really loving that which is not yet available for him or possessed by him. Certainly. Then he and every other who wish, uh, rather, then he and every other who desires, desires what is not in his possession and not there, what he has not and what he is not himself and what he lacks. Those are the sorts of things of which there is desire and love. Certainly. Come now, let us run over again what has been agreed. Love is, first of all, of something. Next, of those things which one lacks. Yes. This being granted then, remember what things you said in your speech were the objects of love. I will remind you, if you wish. I think you said something like this. The gods arrange their business through love of beautiful things, for there could not be a love for ugly things. Didn't you say something like that? Yes, I did. And quite reasonably, too, my friend. And if this is so, would not love be love of beauty, not of ugliness? Uh-huh. Well, now it has been agreed that he loves what he lacks and has not. Yes. Then love lacks and has not beauty. That must be. Very well. Do you say that what lacks beauty and in no wise has beauty is beautiful? Oh, certainly not. Then if that is so, do you still agree that love is beautiful? <laughs> I fear, Socrates, I knew nothing of what I said. Oh, no, it was a fine speech, Agathon. <laughs> but one little thing more. Don't you think good things are also beautiful? Oh, I do. Then if love lacks beautiful things, and good things are beautiful, he should lack good things, too. Whatever, Socrates, I really could not contradict you. Contradict let it, the truth. Let it be as you say. Uh -huh. right? Let it be as you say. Right? Whatever. Yeah. Right? Like her. <laughs> what did he do? That's a very good dialogue, isn't it? And mm -hmm. that's the interlude between the two speeches. It sets this, it's the prelude. It's a prologue to his speech. That's what it's doing. It's playing a role. It's a prelude to the speech. And this major phrase in here, you have to keep watch of. Let's go back into it, shall we? And Socrates went on. Therefore, this love for these blessings to preserve for him into the future, right? Therefore, this love for these blessings to be preserved for him into the future and to be always present for him, this is really loving. I N G. This is loving. Rather bold statement, doesn't it? Yeah. 
take away. What does it mean? Go back, take away. No. Therefore, this love, for these blessings, right? You have to have a whole bunch of things called blessings, right? Here they are. To preserve, to be preserved for him into the future. Preserved and to be always present for him. This is really loving. That which is not yet available for him or possessed by him. So it sort of punctuates the fact that love is a lack and a desire, even if it's to keep on having things that we already possess? Because we don't possess the future. Okay. It's, it's worse than mine. Okay, stay in the corner. this love for these blessings to be preserved for him into into the future right into the future right. what does that mean to be reserved for into the future unchanging right. 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 it's an unchanging and to be always yeah. present for him hey, this is really loving that which is not yet available for him and it were possessed by him. Now, I'm trying to get you to stay in that quote and be puzzled by it. Am I, am I doing my job? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Here, <clears throat> when he's talking about the future, that's a, a concept or a construct in time. Yes, it is. And there's a problem with it because of the issue of the future can never be in the present. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that's, of course that's true. In the oh, true. So because, wait a minute. If love is a desire, and a desire is not what you have, but what you want, mm -hmm. then it's not in the present. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm. Wow, we can never have it. But it's actually also, it's, mm. its goal in a way is to kind of supersede time, because it's saying that it's for these things to always be present for him. So that's, that's there. That implies being outside of time. That's the yeah, thing. that's true. That's, that's there. So loving, so loving is that experience of totally being in lack and wanting something and never, ever, ever getting it. That's what he's calling loving. Well, the, what you added is, is uh, going to be a subject for exploration. Whether or not you ever get it is another issue. Well, but in the but sense to be in the saying, state of love, it's not yet available for him or possessed by him. So it is something that he doesn't have. He's loving something that he doesn't have. Hey. <clears throat> I love you. So she says, so you desire me. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Maybe someday. Well, glad to hear it. <laughs> well, what have you done for me lately? Huh? Uh, she might say, uh, 
Up your thought. About uh, uh, loving. Now that I know you love. Now that I know you desire me. Mm. Could she say that? Sure. Yes or no? Yes. Oh, oh. So now he has to make a move, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. He says, well then, uh, if I get you, then all those, uh, shall we call them at this moment, blessings, will be mine. Wait a minute. Where is this? Yeah. She says, yeah. 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 In the future. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. I mean, if she stays in the language, hmm. if I get you, if I get you. Oh, right. Yeah. Then she could obviously say, yeah. Yeah, it's in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he's got to come back, doesn't he? Yes. And what's he got to say? I no longer want to love. I don't want to be loving you. If loving is something that is going to take place in the future. Is that right? Right, right. He doesn't say that. But she might have to say, he might have to change it and say, say, uh, will you uh, be my beloved. Uh-oh, what does that do? Captured. Does that raise the ante in this discussion? I don't quite understand what that means. Good. That means whether or not she's willing to do what? To be had by him. To be had by him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So she says, well, if you do, you ain't going to be loving me anymore. You'll be... Possessing me. Yeah. Is that what she should say? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. Can I have you into the oh. future? Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. But she might, if she's clever, she might say, well, i uh, tell you what. Um, if she's clever. <laughs> how long are you going to be around? <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially if she's clever. <laughs> so she might say, yeah, but it ain't going to be for tonight. Mm -hmm. Unless it's what? Present to me in the future. Mm -hmm. right. Always present. Mm. So what kind of a commitment does he have to make? To love it always. Sneak in that terrible word, always. always. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is that right? So he would That's, have to always be her lover. That's right. Or he's no longer the and on a higher level, he's no longer a lover. No. Mm. Right? She could, she could say, "Hey, what, uh, aren't you uh, yeah. getting tired of just desiring me? Uh, let's hi let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. And you won't be <laughs> desiring. <laughs> you'll you'll, you'll be doing what? Possessing." But, is the desiring a precondition for getting to that oh, yeah. next stage? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, is this what he's doing? <laughs> and he's going to have to use all of those key words that was, uh, the one that was present in Agathon's speech? Figure that out, Yeah. He'll be enjoying the blessings. Mm. This purifies language, doesn't it? A lot changes when you purify language. Well, I just thought we'd take a little time tonight to go over a couple of words. Of, for, E R, B, I N G. What? How, why does this purify language? How, I don't know. It doesn't. 
I'll take it back. It doesn't purify language, does it? No, I'd rather you stick to your guns. Wait, wait a minute. No, it's, excuse me. It does? Yes, it does. Uh, could you explain to my colleague? Because I forgot. It'd be very clear with what you're saying. Whether it's ING or ED or possess. Because in the everyday language, the word love could cover a whole range whole of activities range. and being. And he, rather than that, says, excuse me, it's not an activity, it's a desire. See, the, the whole thing comes down to this. Among the desires, when you put into it, love. That's all. Everything follows from that. Um, Michael? Am I wrong to, to see that there are actually two kinds of... Right, well, let me do it again. As a, uh, would, it, would I be wrong if I see two different kinds of loves in this process? The love before you have, in this example, before before the, the boy uh, would have the girl, and the love that he would have one or after he's had the girl. See, that's the problem in the world. There are many ways in which you can use it. But, strictly speaking, he wants to preserve this language and this usage. That's the whole battle. See, would you not agree people can use the word love, I love this, I love that, and when you ask them really what they mean, they desire it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have all of this behind it. Or they could use the word love in the same way. Oh, you love her means really, are they saying love in that sense is desire? Then you don't have her in the popular use of language. <laughs> Under the table? <laughs> oh, there he is. I missed my little. No, okay. No, I'm following. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sounds so like you raise the question. Yes, sir. So about whether or not we're purifying language. And now it goes back to you. Is there a sense in which she's doing that? Definitely as far as okay. distinguishing love as a desire. No. Like Starts that. with that. I've never heard anyone in the popular that. sense, it need not be. It could, it could be the same word for loving. It could be used in a wide variety of senses, and not with that ever or always. Go no, ahead. Yes, please. Yes. Um, I guess my question is: Are there two different kinds of desires? Well, that's the issue, aren't it? If you use his language, are there different kinds of love? That's the issue. See, like. Uh, you can certainly, a, a person can love a wide variety of things. If you take the word love out and say, look here, what are you seeking? Let's put it on one level. Pleasure. I mean, everyone has, you know, pursues pleasure in any number of ways in which they do it. From getting an ice cream to wherever it is. The question is, do you want to use the word love for it? I mean, there are many kinds of human relationships, and you can put the word love in there any way you want, but the question is, if you back off and say, excuse me, I'd rather use it in this strict sense, then a lot of things are not going to be old. Purifying, in that sense. Yeah. In this sense, it's saying, if you want to use that word, remember, there's some kind of curious involvement where you're willing to say there's something about it that will, that will be continuous. Mm -hmm. You might say, excuse me, I, I use the term for one night stands. You say, well, that's pleasure. Go ahead and do it. But don't call it love. love. In what sense? In Plato's sense. So love is not temporary then in Plato's? It's not it's not a temporary state. Not a temporary. So it makes the, the, the purifying makes the intention clear. And one has to, yes, one has to also have the intention. It's a full, that's the way it is. 
His clearness is based upon the fact of his metaphysic. This is the step into metaphysics. Right, because That's right. desire cannot exist in the body, and it cannot exist anywhere eternally except within the soul. Yeah, but pleasure exists in the body, and we can understand it. But but the body is only an instrument of the soul. It is not, you know, eternal, and it is not, you know, something that has desires. It's simply a mechanism, as as Plato and Socrates point out. Sure. And why? And that's why the metaphysic is necessary, you know, in having the soul. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes. And this is the doorway into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. He also yeah. goes on to define what the object of love is, which is. Beauty. And then he clarifies that further by um, equating beauty with good. Yes. Yes. So it's, it's really so in his model, the object of love is always beauty and good. Yeah. You know, like once, you know, you can take a look at the idea of beauty and say, uh, uh, I don't know whether you remember him. But there used to be a guy that used to show up on Friday nights, Harry Drovidovich McGee. And uh, he had the most beautiful girl that anyone has ever seen. And, you know, she'd come in and nothing was done because everyone would just stare and look at everyone wanted her. Oh, by the way, she's a great person. She had a record of, uh, um, unfortunately, her lovers, all of them, none of them ever survived. <laughs> Uh, schizophrenic, she had uh, a list of uh, syphilis and also <laughs> she had a whole, well, let's, let's say she had all of them. Then she was the most beautiful, everyone desired her. Wow. No. Right, because beauty is enough, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It reminds me of... It doesn't have to be good. No. Just what about the Beauty's same? enough. What about the saying? that my father used to tell me, he used to say, uh, all good things are beautiful, but not all beautiful things are good. Oh, that's, that's, mm, wow, that's you're a wise father. Good job. Okay, enough. Then we play with Socrates' speech next time. Fair? Okay. Fair. Fair. Fair.